Um, and we'll start with um, officially acknowledging that Selectman Jesse Murmel will be leaving us. This is her last meeting as a member of the Board of Selectmen. Um, and I have a few th comments that I will make, um, and perhaps other members of the board would like to join in. Uh, I first got to know Jesse in the spring of 2006 when we spent a lot of time together, so to speak, on the campaign trail running for selectmen. Against each other. <laughs> Against each other, right. But I no, also. For an open seat. This is true. This is true. Competing for the f open seat. Yes. Right, right. Um, I learned we have a lot in common, including Dutch ancestry, a love of Dutch cookies, and a strong commitment to good public policy and to public service. I happened to win that year, but Jesse came back strong and was elected in 2007. And she's taken on leadership for the town in many ways. I'm just going to list a few. She's been our point person for environmental and climate change issues, and she is responsible for achieving Brookline's designation as a green community with help from many of our uh, staff and other community members, but Jesse has provided the leadership for that. She re-envisioned and energized our Martin Luther King Day celebration, and I hope you will be able to join I us will. this year. I will be there. Okay. Um, as our resident tweeter and um, the expert on social media, which I confess I am not, she has pushed us into interactive public information applications and um, moved us in the direction of much more use of uh, information technology um, as ways of helping to solve community problems. As an advocate for healthy living, she's worked on car sharing, bikeways, and bringing Hubway to Brookline, and also supporting food trucks. Now, I'm not clear that that's healthy, but she still supported food trucks. Uh, she's also the only member of the present board who has run the Boston Marathon. She has the voice and the confidence that she was able to fill in for Estelle Cates leading town meeting and singing the Star Spangled Banner at our November town meeting. And not the least, she keeps better track of her dog Isabella than Dennis Lehane keeps track of his. Oh. <laughs> so um, we wish her great success in her new appointment as communications director for Governor Patrick and hope that she will answer the phone when we call her. Any other thoughts, comments? Selectman Benka? Uh, first, uh, we'll all miss your cookies around the <laughs> yes. holidays, and I just hope you won't forget us. I, I could be talked into making Never. a delivery. Yeah. Um, and I personally am going to miss passing notes with you <laughs> up here. Uh, probably something we shouldn't have been doing, but uh, that we I have. I they've all been shredded. They have. They have. <laughs> Most of them have. Uh, uh. Others uh, I might use in the future. Um, I, I do want to say something, though, very seriously, and that is... Um, I, I want to note how much I've admired your demeanor on the board. Um, we, uh, as a board up here, tend to push ahead uh, with our calendar, with, with the work that we do, uh, but you've always been very careful to take the time to recognize the effort that people have made uh, to serve on committees, to make proposals, and to come before this board. And um, I've been throughout our years together on the board, been impressed by your thoughtfulness, and uh, I've tried to learn from it. Um, and maybe it's, hopefully it's rubbed off a little bit, uh, but uh, you uh, have always been um, so uh, very solicitous of the people who come before this board, and you've recognized them. And uh, I think that it's, um, it's, it says a lot about you, and it says a lot about the town. So thank you. My Selectman turn. Goldstein? Yes, Absolutely. and I should just say before you speak that Selectman Daly is out of town and uh, sends her uh, support to you in your new endeavors, whatever they are, said she was very sorry she couldn't be here tonight, but she will definitely get in touch with you, find out what's happening. Selectman Goldstein. Well, uh, Jesse, when, when I got the, uh, the happy slash sad news that uh, you'd be leaving us, I started right away thinking about you and, and uh, what you, you mean to the town, what you've meant to this board. I couldn't help drawing immediate 
parallels with uh, Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. Oh, okay, okay. that's <laughs> my, my immediate parallel. Farm girl, naivete, uh, you know, even has the little dog too, a different name. Uh, <laughs> Perfect hair and a beautiful singing voice too. Instead of uh, um, somewhere over the rainbow, we we get Star Spangled Banner, but uh, one but time it, performance in Estelle's absence. <laughs> but it works. It, love of cookies. I, I think Dorothy uh, also loves cookies. But you know, instead of of uh, seeking to go home, you sought to bring this town and yourself someplace someplace new, and and and, and uh, you've done a, a a really terrific job in so many areas of leadership. Uh, your uh, leadership in, in climate action and, and environmental issues um, and dealing with uh, uh, climate change, the Hubway Project, uh, Martin Luther King Day celebration, uh, the various diversity issues that you've been upfront on, uh, and a, a couple of other skills that I think are worth mentioning too. First of all, I don't. Th I think the town is going to be wanting for an advocate for the swimming pool from now on too. <laughs> we need someone else to start swimming so that we have uh, feet on the ground and arms in the in the water at the, at the pool. Um, but I think your um, involvement with state politics has been an incredible asset to the town, and, the, and you know it's no coincidence that you're you're, you're moving to the the governor's office because you've worked so tireless, tirelessly to to um, to, to uh, interact with, with 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 that with that universe. But the town has benefited so greatly from your your connections there over the years, and uh, you know. I mean, how many times as a board have we have we uh, d discussed something and uh, realized that we needed a Beacon Hill connection on, on, on an issue, and Jesse was the one who, who had it uh, immediately. Um, I also want to mention uh, your leadership at, with Brookline Mental Health and with the uh, Team Brookline Project most recently, too, which I'll add, have already gotten solicitations to become a sponsor of Team, Measure, uh, Team, Team Brookline. So that's already come to fruition. <coughs> Um, on a personal note, Jesse, I, I've never heard you utter a negative word about anyone in any context, and that's an incredible thing to Clearly say. Clearly haven't and, been listening and, closely and, enough. Uh, you're, you're a skillful communicator, and that's why uh, the governor has tapped you. You're witty and wise beyond your years. And I think, uh, you know, because you're youthful, you're, you also serve as a role model in this community, particularly to, to the younger members of, of, of this community. And, uh, and uh, I think that's something you and your parents can be very proud of. Thank you for all your service. So we, we have, um, you actually may have guessed, but we've decided that you need a memento oh, no. to take with you. Uh. And so here is the marathon dog. Uh. Um, I think it would be really nice if you left it with us for a little while, because we could probably have a little engraved plaque that says something about Jesse Mermel's tenure on the Board of Selectmen. Sure, I would be. But you're, you're welcome to treasure it for a moment. Anyway. I will absolutely, when it is done, <laughs> take it with me and I will, I will bring it to the governor's office and yes, yes. put it on my desk there. So, uh, and Ken, you still have, a, you have an extra dog. Yeah, yeah, no, no, we it's know okay, we got a spare. There's, it's hope, there's yes. hope. Somebody else may run the marathon. Good, good, well, We're Ken not going to give that one up. was lightly. the leading selectman in the Flag yeah, Day no, Parade. No, no, yeah. no, no. And, it's, and it looks a bit like Toto also. Yes, right? exactly. exactly. Sure. Well, thank you. This is great. Actually, that um, since you've retired one half of the dog combination, those um, went to your participation in one kind of race, in road races and athletic races. But I suspect that we're going to hear something about uh, your participation in other kinds of races in the future of a political nature. And um, uh, I think... Uh, we all wish you well Thank you. if and when that happens, <laughs> uh, since I think it'll be a lot easier beating one or two people than it is beating 5,000 or more people in the marathon. Well, to be so. clear, I did not win the marathon. I know. <laughs> Many people <laughs> think that I am Kenyan. I, know. I get that a lot, I but, I, but I did uh, not win. But, uh, I but think you finished. There, I, think there are, yes. I think there are more races in your future. Wow. And, uh, we, we look forward to those. Thank you. I, I, I won't comment on that, but I will say a few things if that's all right. Oh, absolutely. Share. You have the microphone. Uh, so I, I really just have a whole bunch of thank yous with, I guess, some uh, observations mixed within. Uh, first, I, I really want to thank the town staff, mainly because I think it's a group that gets thanked last, despite the fact that they're the ones who do the bulk of the work that makes this town 
uh, run. I can't think of many people who would take a job where when your bosses ask you to work on a project or a report, and you then present that project or report, and if they don't like it or have feedback or want you to go back to the drawing board, uh, that happens in public broadcast on local television and covered in the local newspaper. Most of us have that experience in a closed door conference room with a handful of colleagues and uh, the staff from the town administrator to the department heads to Scott from DPW who I see every morning emptying the trash cans on Beacon Street when I'm walking <laughs> my dog have such an incredibly fantastic attitude, unbelievable dedication to this community and uh, bring a level of expertise, patience, and a sense of humor that uh, is truly remarkable and has, uh, observing that and getting to work with that group of people has been one of the, the best parts of, of this job. Uh, I also want to thank the town, uh, as cheesy as that might sound. I moved here the last week of August in 1999. A little over 13 years ago, I was 19 years old. I didn't know a single person in New England, let alone in Brookline. I moved to Brookline because I transferred <coughs> to Boston College for my sophomore year of school, and when you transfer to BC, you don't get housing. So I walked into a realtor's office, and this weird <coughs> realtor guy named Zach with long, crazy hair showed me a studio apartment in Brookline Village. And Brookline, Worcester, Gloucester, New Bedford meant nothing to me. You know, when you move to a new city, you don't know the neighborhoods or the suburbs or anything like that. And within three weeks of moving here, I called my parents and I said, I'm staying here. I fell in love instantly, and as luck would have it, uh, I happened to meet some folks who were involved in town politics, and the May after I moved here, I was standing at the polls in Precinct 7 handing out flyers on Election Day, and Phyllis Giller and Pawnee Katz uh, met me at the polls and sucked me into their web of Precinct 7 town meeting, and it has been... Uh, a ride since then where this isn't just a place where I happened to crash at night when I got back from school. Uh, it's truly become uh, my home. And to have a community be so incredibly welcoming that in the course of 13 years I could go from being a 19-year-old without a single local name in my Rolodex uh, to not just making a life for myself and making a home here, but being afforded the opportunity to really become a member of the community and uh, eventually assume a leadership position, I think says more about this town than uh, anything ever could. And it, it truly blows my mind that this community has given me that opportunity. And finally, I, I want to thank the board, and I, I wish Nancy were here. Um, you know, there are many rungs on the ladder of American politics from dog catcher to President of the United States. And I think it's safe to say, with all due respect to us, that the Board of Selectmen is on one of the lower rungs of the vast political ladder. Um, but the thing that I think everyone in politics has in common is that you have to have the ability to, to work with people, regardless of whether or not you agree with them. And I think if you turn on the news every night and you watch what's going on around the country and in Washington, you get the impression that that must be impossible. That it just isn't fathomable that people who might disagree on something could work together on something else. And in nearly six years on the board, uh, I walk away knowing that that's not how things are in Brookline. You know, I have had disagreements with every single person on this board. Some of them of the blink and you miss it variety, and others that have been more intense. And I think every selectman, past and present, can say the same thing. But the piece of that that's most remarkable is that a disagreement on issue X has never seeped into a disagreement or a conversation about issue Y. It's never once gotten personal. It's never once extended beyond the boundaries of the issue that we were discussing. And most importantly, it's never paralyzed the town. You know, disagreements on this board never cause gridlock. We're always able to move forward. There's always a compromise around the corner. Uh, and I wish it didn't speak volumes about the nature of this board because I wish that was the norm uh, in every other political setting, but unfortunately that's not the case. And uh, it truly has been a pleasure to work with uh, everyone sitting up here and the folks who, who came before you earlier in my tenure. And uh, I'm grateful for the collegial relationships we've had, for the friendships we've developed, and 
I might not be sitting here every Tuesday night anymore, but I will absolutely <laughs> take your call and certainly plan to stay active uh, around town and in, in various political and civic things in, uh, in the community. So not getting rid of me that easily. But thank you for the kind words, and I appreciate each of you sticking to the scripts I've given you <laughs> so closely. Well, um, I think uh, you've demonstrated that you will definitely be a success as communications director. Um, and we wish you much luck in your new position. And um, we are very, very pleased to know that this is still your home. And that Not we'll see you anywhere. around. Walking Isabella, if nothing else. The little dog. Yes. yes, right. So we were asked, I've been asked, and I suspect uh, others have too, what happens <clears throat> when a select person resigns? And so I'm going to ask Mr. Kleckner to give us just a very brief synopsis. It's not a crisis, but there will only be four of us <laughs> for a while. Well, thank you. Uh, before I do that, I have my own little story too. Ah, uh, uh, yes. I, I came here a little over. Uh, two years ago and interviewed before this board and I thought I knew pretty much everything there was to know about local government and how technology worked in local government and then Jesse asked me a question and it really um, told me that I really needed to update my, uh, my resume if you will or my my knowledge about technology in local government and I was challenged by you to do that and I've learned a great deal about it and uh, think that we've you know, made a lot of progress together. And so uh, I thank you for, for challenging me on that. And I, I certainly thank you for all your contributions and your support and just your uh, comments to the staff uh, tonight make me very proud to have worked with you and I wish you well in your career. Thank you. Um, so as you mentioned, uh, Madam Chairman, there is a process uh, when a selectman resigns uh, or vacates the office. It's all covered by state law. It's nothing uh, that we can do locally, but uh, essentially, we've uh, consulted with the town council and our town clerk, and essentially um, there is an option for the board uh, to call a special election, but it is optional. The board is not obligated to do so. And frankly, um, I I if you did, even if you did it as early as next week, um, the election wouldn't happen until um, mid to, to, to late April, or, or I should say uh, somewhat earlier in April. And uh, the uh, town election, which uh, would have to happen as well, would uh, would happen in on May 7th this year. So literally, it would be no more than about a month or so that um, uh, a selectman would serve until they had to run again uh, at the annual town election. And uh, I would say that the uh, town clerk has uh, tallied up some of the cost of a special election, and they exceed $60,000. So uh, I hope uh, it would be my strong recommendation that um, that the board does not call for a special election. There is a process that the board would be obligated to call a special election if there was a petition of uh, 200 <coughs> or, uh, registered voters or um, uh, or I believe there's a certain percentage, but I think in our case it would be 200 registered voters. Uh, but again, um, that election would happen and that uh, that uh, person who won the election would serve for no, no more than about four to six weeks. Right. So in that case, we will put the matter on the calendar for next week for discussion, but I just wanted to uh, just generally talk about that this evening. Sure. Selectman Banker? We, we can't appoint Barney Frank no, until <laughs> May. We cannot appoint anyone. He's a resident. He's a new president. He doesn't live here. <laughs> okay. Well, and I think um, w with that, we will uh, – uh, everybody should understand that we'll put it on the calendar for next uh, meeting. Um, my own personal inclination is to say that it makes absolutely no sense. We will struggle with an empty chair left by Selectman Mermel. It will be partly we will remember her and partly we will say, Jesse, where did you go? Right. We can keep the dog for a while maybe. We can do that. So, all right. With that, we can move now to our regular business for the evening unless there's another. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, other comments. Uh, any events that members of the board would like to discuss? So. Yes, Selectman Banker. Thank you. Um, we um, had some excitement on our street over the holidays. Uh, there was a fire uh, early in the morning on, I think, December 30th um, across the street from our home and our neighbor's home. And I am really pleased that uh, uh, Fire Chief Ford and uh, Police Chief O'Leary are here tonight because I want to make some comments about their departments. Um, we got a call at around 12.15 in the morning um, from our neighbor's alarm company, and by the time I made it outside, uh, flames were already visible, 
uh, at the house, and um, uh, there, but there were already two patrol cars on the scene. Uh, patrol officer Stephen Young and patrol officer John Bradley were there. Um, they had already, by the time I got outside, uh, had gotten the residents out of the house. And um, one thing I was touched by was that they were making sure that there were no pets inside. Uh, they were asking the residents, are there any pets? And I, in, in retrospect, I look back and I think that may have been concern for pets, but also concern that somebody would run back into the house to try to get a pet if one was left behind. But uh, they, they verified that everybody was out and that, um, and that there were no pets. Um, shortly after that, the fire department arrived on the scene and uh, started dealing with the fire, and I'll get, I'll get back to that. Uh, but the residents uh, of the house had come out in their stocking feet and their pajamas, and this was uh, the night after we had had the snowfall. So um, we got them into our house, and um, uh, because of that, uh, I was, both Carl and I, my wife and I, were able to see the operation of the police and fire departments up close uh, over the next three <coughs> hours from about 12.30 in the morning until about 3.30 in the morning. Um, officers Young and Bradley were remarkably sympathetic. Um, Officer Young uh, took the responsibility for gathering information and uh, the, the residents were obviously shaken uh, by, by the events. They were upset and he was extraordinarily patient and solicitous in taking his time to to find out who was there and, and uh, what the relationships were and, and, and what had happened. Um, Officer Bradley um, made a real effort uh, to keep the owners of the property, the residents of the property, up to date and to, and to comfort them. Um, he kept coming back with updates. Uh, for example, they've got the fire out and now they're just making sure it hasn't spread inside the walls. Um, sometime later he came back and he said, I've been inside and it's smoky inside, but I've been into the house and the fire didn't spread. I looked at the rooms above where the fire was and uh, those rooms uh, weren't damaged inside. Um, and another report that he came back with, uh, he kept uh, updating the, the residents saying, it'll be about an hour before you'll be able to get back in and get some things out. So. Um, the, um, you know, the, 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 our neighbors were obviously shaken by what had happened, but uh, these two uh, patrol officers really um, went out of their way to, to make this process as easy as they could. As for the fire department, um, they arrived on the scene a minute or two after the police did. They efficiently put the fire out. Uh, they, over the next several hours, they verified that the fire hadn't spread inside the walls. Uh, they, they did some work. They opened some walls uh, on the exterior and, and, I, and in one location, the interior of the house. Um, they were under the direction of Deputy Chief Keith Flaherty. And um, he, when he came after um, uh, they had uh, gotten the fire under control and, and verified that it hadn't spread and wasn't spreading, he came in and he was the individual who took um, the residents into the house so that they could get some things and he was uh, likewise solicitous, uh, equally solicitous as the, as the uh, uh, police officers had been and um, uh, I think uh, really made it uh, as easy as it could be in a difficult situation. Finally, uh, Carla and I had a sleepover at our house that night and uh, one of those who slept over was a toddler who had been displaced by the fire. Um, you know, not surprisingly, we didn't have things for a toddler uh, in our house, but uh, Police Sergeant Jennifer Pastor went to her house and got diapers, baby clothes, bedding, and a portable crib, uh, which she brought over to our house um, for, for this child. So just all in all, um, just professionally in terms of dealing with the fire, in terms of getting people out, but also from a human standpoint in dealing with the, uh, the human needs of the individuals. It was just a remarkably professional and sympathetic and compassionate response. So I really do want to pay credit to the fire department and to the police department. Okay, Slackman Mermel. <coughs> okay. A much less intense note, uh, the MLK event is yes. 
two weeks from yesterday, the 21st at 2.30 at the Coolidge Corner Theater. Uh, it'll go from 2.30 to 4, doors open at 2.15, and uh, Boston City Councilor Ayanna Presley, the first woman of color ever elected to the Boston City Council, uh, will be the keynote speaker. There will be a great video put together by Brookline Hub celebrating uh, a, a group of kids from the high school who have taken this trip called Sojourn to the Past, where they travel throughout the landmarks of the civil rights movement in the South. Uh, and Harvey Brobman and the team from Brookline Hub have put together about a 20-minute video interviewing them and their teachers about their experience. And we'll have lots of different musical groups from around town. It should be a great event. So the 21st at the Coolidge at 2.30, and if you can't make it, Brookline Access is going to be filming it and rebroadcasting. Sounds wonderful, and I will say, <clears throat> one of the things you will have to do is figure out how we get our next Martin Luther King Day as well planned with such great um, content, I guess I would say, as the two that you we've just had, the last year and the one coming up. That's really been a, um, a wonderful experience, so we are, we are grateful to you for that. All right, any other events? No? Okay. Then we will move on to our official business, which is the um, miscellaneous items on the calendar. Uh, we'll do the minutes, and there <coughs> are there any <coughs> items that members would like to hold for questions or discussion? We have a few thousand dollars mixed up in here, I notice. I would hold uh, B and J, please. I mean, yeah, B and J. B and J, okay. Anybody else have a... Uh, do, um, would the um, uh, police and fire like to comment about C and D, the um, donations? Sure. Okay, so that's C, D, and L. Hmm? J. J. Sorry, J. Oh, yeah. oh, for the police, you're saying. Ken said J. He said J, but I, uh, Dick, do you want to have And also L, L. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Uh, okay. Please. Okay, so let's do the public safety uh, items, and we can start with the um, donations from the Korean Church. Thank you. Um, before, uh, Slugman Banker, thank you very much for those those remarks. I let the officers know that you had uh, emailed me and, and let me know that you thought they had done a great job, so I think they were very appreciative of hearing from you. Yeah, I, I, m I must say, um, you, one does not see what goes on um, Normally, you, you see it from a distance, but uh, uh, just being with uh, the victims of this fire um, while they were in our house really enabled us to get a real picture of what went on. It was really remarkable. Thanks. Thanks. And Selectman Marmel, I know we spoke yesterday, yeah. but um, I want to offer my congratulations to you. Thank you. It's a very well-deserved um, job that you got. I know you're going to do very well, and I want to say thanks for all your assistance, your help, and your guidance that you've given us over the years on the board. So thank you very much. Thank you. And to get down to a little bit of business, <laughs> um, once again this year, Reverend Lee of the, uh, of the uh, Korean church across the street here has been very kind to the police department, and he has sent in a donation in the amount of $500. As we've done in, in years in the past, the board has uh, accepted this donation on our behalf, and we've used it to help with our community service outreach and the events that we do within the community. And I'd like to be able to do that again this year. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and Chief, you can talk about the Korean church and um, any comments you want to add about the fire as well, okay. please. <clears throat> thank you. And uh, Slackman Banker, thank you very much. It's always nice to hear those type of uh, reports. Uh, I hope you understand when I say I'm not surprised. Uh, in both departments, I see a tremendous level of professionalism. So uh, I'm very happy that, that you were able to uh, witness it firsthand, so to speak. I'm happy, not that there was a fire, but it's nice when uh, people get to see the operation and can appreciate it. And Selectman Mimel, are you really sure? <laughs> Come on. I know. Uh, as uh, Chief O'Leary stated, uh, we've also been fortunate to uh, receive a, another donation from, from the church, and we typically uh, come before the board, and the board has authorized us to accept it, and we put it into a, what we call a gift account that we have in the Fire Prevention Bureau, and we utilize it to, to purchase small incidental items that may not be normally budgeted for that we may need throughout the year. It always comes in handy. And so uh, I would 
ask that you do the same this year. Well, we are very grateful to the Korean church for being good neighbors to us in other ways as well. Um, in addition to these gifts, they're all often, often always very generous uh, in allowing us to use space there for different events. Um, okay, and while we're just gonna go through, we'll, we'll take a couple of, um, let's see, this is a DPW one, Jay, the uh, Hurricane Irene. <coughs> reimbursement, and then we'll uh, ask the uh, police chief to tell us about L. Oh, Hi, okay. I'm here on J. Um, okay. This is just the last of the federal reimbursement for um, damages related to this uh, Hurricane Irene, not to be confused with Hurricane Sandy. Yes, <laughs> right. Okay. Are, are, do you want to ask? A oh yeah, yeah. It was it was a it was a small question. I was just a little confused. So the. the the grant that we're accepting is $178,000. I noticed on page J2, there's two other amounts there, 21426 and 28957 yep, and Those are just other transfers that came into the comptroller's office that day. So oh, it's I not see. related so to that's it. It just shows the money that came in. I see. Okay. I wanted <laughs> to make sure I knew what, what I was yep. looking for. And that's it. Thank you, Melissa. Okay. And then... <clears throat> The question came uh, about item L, the grant for emergency management performance. Yes, uh, as an emergency management team in the town, we were fortunate enough to have the opportunity to apply for a grant for $25,000 that we could use to uh, enhance our capabilities at the emergency operations center. And it comes at a really good time because uh, on the UASI region, all of the EOCs are going to be going through an upgrade on both software and some hardware uh, that we've had in place since we since we started this several years ago. Uh, so with this money, if the, choose, if the board chooses to allow us to accept it, um, we will look to uh, upgrade our laptops that have been getting pretty old up there. Uh, we can also up, upgrade some of the uh, computer screens, the monitors that we have there, and also um, update some of the software that we have running in there that allows us to connect to some of our uh, partners in the other communities. So it, it's a good opportunity to get this money. It's going to come in handy with the overall upgrade that all the EOCs in the nine cities and towns are going to get uh, over the next couple of months. And I would like to see if the board would accept it on our behalf. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to vote these as a group. So the next item uh, so. would be, are there any additions or Corrections to the minutes. Just, just on, oh, you want on a question? item L. Uh, I'm, I'm going to channel Selectman Daly since oh, she's okay. not here <laughs> and uh, commend you on going after and getting this grant. I know it, it kind of felt empty leaving here. So. Well, <laughs> I, I didn't want you to okay. feel that. Uh, absolutely, and, and I second that. Thank, um, you. thank you, Chief. So, are there any corrections or additions to the minutes from December 18th? A very minor. Correction. Okay. Pass this in. Sightman Benka, have you? No, there. No um, corrections. I was. I was not there for. Oh, that's right. You a missed a piece of, of that them, one. So okay. I'll All right. Vote insofar as I was there. <laughs> okay. Then uh, I'm going to move. Uh, a quick question on, on B. Also. Yeah. Oh, B. Uh, Sorry. I see Joe And again, Mr. Viola. I we we weren't clear whether you'd said B and D or B. Uh, so I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Skip it. B is in boy. Yeah, got it. Uh, Joe, a really, really quick question again, just for my own clarification purposes. So there's a question that says, um, uh, any unused grant funds? And the answer is no. But then there's this uh, item in the agreement with HUD that says $11,300 is refunded. In my mind, right. it's incongruous, but, I, but I'm sure I'm not understanding. So. Yeah, no, there actually was a small remainder. You're right. There was $11,000 that we actually couldn't spend. Right. We, we did our best to spend it. Unfortunately, we couldn't. Uh, I noticed that in the paperwork as well. Uh, I'll double check with Gail Lewis to be sure there's not some transposed number. But the, the, uh, the part where it shows that there was a small remainder is actually correct. Okay, so is it, does that make the, the answer to section two incorrect? <coughs> Any unused grant funds canceled by HUD? Well, you've answered no. Is that, is that incorrect? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess that it doesn't, but, uh, it, and I realize it needs to be executed by uh, Selectman DeWitt, but 
I'm Gail is pretty if anything she's very thorough so I'm, I'm guessing it's it's just a small error okay. but thank you and sure. I'm going to tell you that I know myself um, <clears throat> that there are some strange things if you look at page B4 the bottom bullet it says it, uh, the $11,000 in grant funds will be recaptured by HUD upon execution. I don't know exactly what recaptured is, but I think they're going to take it back. No, no, I, I, got, I got that. <laughs> okay, I was just sorry. struggling with kind of the inconsistency from yeah, the first page, right, but I'm sure know. there's a technical reason why. Yeah, right. The well, I, I think uh, we know that um, our administrator is meticulous about this, <laughs> and I would be Say surprised if Gail had missed a box. Mm -hmm. Or made an error but um, do check it before it's finally submitted we will do okay Thank all right you. okay any other questions about miscellaneous items before we vote them then <clears throat> I am going to move approval of the minutes from December 18th 2012 as amended all in favor, please say aye. Selectman Murmel. aye. Selectman Binka aye. Selectman Goldstein aye. chair votes aye and to expedite things a little bit, I'm going to move that we approve the items on, under miscellaneous in the language as um, printed in our calendar. Items B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, and L as um, uh, according to the language in the calendar. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Mermel? Aye. Selectman Benka? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Chair votes aye. <clears throat> now we will move to the main calendar and the first item is a question of police personnel. Thank you, gentlemen. Yes, uh, we, um, unfortunately for us, one of our uh, workers in the dispatch center has decided to, after eight years, to pick up and take a job at Mass General Hospital doing the same type of work. But um, all in all, I think it's a pretty good move for her. I know we had a long discussion because she was torn whether to leave or not. But at the end, um, I think it's good for her and her family at this time. So she decided to leave. She resigned from the department, like I said, after a little bit, of eight, little bit more than eight years uh, this past Friday. And uh, I'm here to ask the board for authorization to fill the vacancy that uh, has just come about. Uh, well, if you give us permission to go ahead, um, Chief Ford and I have already discussed it, uh, and we look to move forward with posting and, and getting uh, the best possible candidate. Well, having okay. just heard um, uh, the story about the fire that Selectman Benka uh, discussed, it, we know how very important these people are uh, to making sure we have rapid response. Um, I, I actually have a sort of a general question, and that is how quickly will you be able to move on this one, do you think? I, I know that we've talked to Sandra uh, yeah. Debo about it. If, um, if we get the okay, we'll move to post it tomorrow, uh, and then it'll be a, a, a waiting period till we get some applications in. Right. And we do have a pretty lengthy hiring process. I remember. I mean, lengthy will mean it'll take about a month to go through right. all the exams right. that we give them. Um, so we would probably run short for at least a month and a half. Right, about six weeks, okay. Yeah. Uh, questions for members of the board for the chief? I have a yeah. question. It, it, chief, it, it, seems like, <coughs> it seems like we've, we have to fill the, this position, not the specific one, but we have to hire new dispatches more than other positions in the town that I'm used to. I, I imagine it's, it's a very difficult and stressful job and that's why, or, or is, there, is there another reason? Is there something we're, we're, we're not seeing? I think it's a very difficult and um, stressful job, just like you said. Um, I, I also think that we have a core group of people that have been with us from the very beginning. Uh, Maureen was, was one of them that came just about after we began um, that are committed to work with us. And there are some people that take the jobs and with the hope of just moving on. Um, we do at this point have a, a really good uh, group of people in there now. And I, we were all kind of surprised that um, she had decided to resign at this point. I mean, I know from talking to her, she was, it was not the easy, easiest decision that she, she had to make. Um, but I think um, our hiring has changed over the past several years. I think we see that we get a, a better 
um, a, you know, a solid candidate, uh, good quality <coughs> people that want to work for us. And now, even if we don't post it, we do have people in the pipeline that have said they want to come here. So we just have decided to put a rigorous hiring process, including a, uh, a, an examination, a computer exam, and then, you know, physical, psychological, and those tests that we didn't have initially, but we do have now. So that's what's going to make it a little bit longer. Okay, um, <clears throat> any other questions from members of the board? Then I move that we authorize filling a vacancy in the position of E911 dispatcher in the E911 dispatch division of the police department. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Mermel. Aye. Selectman Binka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you. Good luck, Chief. Thanks. Next I, item. I'm sorry, yep. just, just thinking a little bit about this, and sorry. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, when we, when we have a position like this, I, I see that your memo was December 27th, um, uh, and I assume that that was pretty close to the time that you, you learned of this, and, and we've let a little bit of time slip here. Um, I'm wondering whether we might consider for positions like this uh, for the town administrator, and this is not something we can do tonight, but for the town administrator to authorize the process to at least start uh, before the board um, authorizes the hiring of the position. Um, and I'm not sure where we draw the line, uh, but where you've got a position that is uh, frontline and stressful and you're going to be putting an overtime burden, I assume, on yes. the existing people, which will make their job even more difficult. I'm, I'm, um, I would just offer that as something to consider for the future. Seems like a reasonable Seems suggestion. Like a good idea. <clears throat> so we'll, we'll talk to the chief about it. Thank um, you. And or we'll have our our guy will talk to your guy and we'll, <laughs> we'll work this out. Okay. Um, next is a vacancy in the fire department. Another retirement, and from and and, and this time another uh, long serving. Uh, I would say. A, uh, an institution in the fire department. Well, I guess you could say she's a long-standing member of the uh, community. Uh, when I came here a little more than a year ago, my executive assistant uh, is Miss Betty Fryer. She's been there a few years. And uh, actually, to be honest, I asked her one day how long she had been there, and she just said, a while. <laughs> and um, I asked her again, and she said, a while. Well, I checked her date of hire, <laughs> and then I went into it, and I said, Betty, you started here three months before I was born. <laughs> um, just, just as a side note, so if you don't mind me embellishing a little. Oh, please go Betty, ahead. Uh, Commissioner Arthur Roche, Commissioner William Burke, Commissioner Robert Taylor, Commissioner Charles Rowley, Chief George Geddes, Chief Francis Pons, Chief Francis Fogarty, Chief Andrew Colgan, Chief William Murphy, Acting Chief John Duffy, Chief James Fallon, Acting Chief Al Sweeney, Chief Robert English, Chief John Spillane, Acting Chief Peter Scarry, Chief John Green, Chief Peter Scarry, Director John Green, and myself. We are the fire chiefs that Ms. Fryer worked with. And I dare say the first 10 she worked for and the next ones, they worked for her. <laughs> Very likely. Uh, many times, uh, Betty, how do we do this? And uh, I often said, uh, uh, for a week at a time, the fire department will run just fine without the fire chief here. <laughs> when Betty was missing for a week, we really felt it. So she's been around a long time and she's going to retire uh, January 25th. So I'm here before you to uh, seek permission, authorization to uh, seek to fill that position. It is a C10 uh, executive assistant position within the fire department and uh, we would like to move forward as expediently as possible. Well, I think she's irreplaceable, but good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions or comments from members of the board? Then I will move that we authorize filling a vacancy in the position of executive assistant C10 in the fire department. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Murmel. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank so you very much. I, Sounds like a good profile opportunity for one of our media outlets. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Okay, um, next item on the agenda are some applicants, candidates for appointment to the Neighborhood Conservation District. 
uh, Stephen Chimenti. Welcome. Um, just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in the Neighborhood Conservation District Commission. Uh, my name is Stephen Cumenti. I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 16. I want to thank the board for allowing me to interview for the, the commission appointment. Um, I've been a Brookline resident for 28 years, and I have raised two children who have attended Brookline schools through high school. Um, Basically, uh, of course, the, net, the, the uh, neighborhood conservation district became an issue with regard to my particular neighborhood, uh, and that's how I started, uh, became interested from the very beginning with it. And I've attended uh, two of the, uh, the, the, the meetings held so far by the uh, neighborhood conservation district. Um, it seems unclear even from the warrant exactly whether there's one commission or there'll be multiple, multiple commissions and exactly how many members they will need, but basically I felt that uh, I wanted, I was interested and I wanted to volunteer uh, to basically give the, 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 board, the uh, selectmen the opportunity to have as many candidates to choose from as possible. And as I say, this has been an interest of mine from, from the beginning of the concept. Um, I believe that the, the town's interest, it's in the town's interest to protect the character of daily life in the town and it's important for the bylaw to be the developed and interpreted by this commission for that purpose. Essentially, the bylaw is written as it has to be really in terms of, of the physical plant of the particular neighborhood, but it's not really <coughs> about the physical plant, it's about the character of the neighborhood as is mentioned in the, in the bylaw itself in a few places. Uh, this distinguishes it really from the zoning and from even the, uh, the um, historical, the local historical district thing, which uh, they are about physical rules, physical limitations, and although this particular uh, warrant, this particular uh, bylaw is, a, is about physical limitations as well, it's really trying to get at the character of a neighborhood, and that's the way the bylaw will need to be interpreted by this commission, and um, I think, uh, so basically you're trying to indirectly and obliquely get at something that is a little bit hard to, to quantify, you're trying to describe space by describing the container, in effect. Um, and I believe I can contribute to that process. I think that uh, I understand the purpose of this, and uh, basically, um, if you know, the selectmen expect that I can contribute to this, I'd be pleased to serve. Okay, I will clarify a little bit, um, and actually, Selectman Benka may follow up on what I have to say, but the bylaw envisions several options. At the moment, yes. the Board of Selectmen is inclined to create a single commission to serve the town, um, and that would be an expanded commission with the maximum number of members, which I believe is seven uh, commissioners and two alternates. So that's the direction we're going in now, and then perhaps in the future, if there are multiple districts created, we might reconsider, but. Well, I understand, and I, I thought perhaps that it was about to be staffed like, as in September, but it seemed like that there was still a need for candidates to consider. Absolutely. <coughs> no, you're right. We, we are, mm -hmm. it is not full. In fact, it's currently an interim commission with some temporary members, mm -hmm. uh, one of whom was a preservation commission member who actually, uh, whose term is over. So there's already one vacancy in the existing interim commission. So we definitely need candidates. And, and that interim commission is a smaller commission. Right. So we, it will be larger and there, and there will be uh, positions that are open. And I, I would note just um, uh, for, um, uh, for your benefit and also for the benefit of uh, Ms. Stava Zak, who's going to be interviewing and, and also people who are listening, that at this stage um, the commission is um, also working with its rules and regulations and its procedures going forward. It's, it's in the uh, process of, of working on those. So um, that is going to be kind of a, a critical first step uh, for the commission as it, uh, as it kind of charts the way for the future. Uh, there is no specific proposal uh, for it to review with regard to uh, any neighborhood conservation district at this point. Um, but I think the, the work in which it's engaged right now is really critical work. Yes. And um, I think um, that members will, will contribute to that. Well, I've been to two of the meetings, as I say, and it was clearly a formative thing, inchoate at this point as far right. as understanding work. Right. Right. 
we, we would agree. <laughs> it's information, I think, mm -hmm. is a, a fair description. Okay, any other questions? Uh, very quick question. Yeah, sure. So, so uh, obviously our, our mm -hmm. existing uh, NCD is, is South Brookline, and it's a critical one for various reasons. Uh, but the NCD is going to have uh, a role, uh, undoubtedly, beyond South Brookline. Uh, you're you're a, a Russet Road resident, and I don't blame you one bit for taking an active interest in this. Can you speak a little bit, though, about your experience with the with the the, the town more broadly? Well, t the, the most the most significant thing for us is really, uh, you know, basically 20, 28 years ago when we moved here, it was really with a view to Brookline as a community, as a neighborhood, basically a community. And um, the idea was essentially to raise our children in a, in a stable environment, a stable space, a neighborhood. Uh, and I have to say that uh, after you know, some of their best for their grown up, they're 27, 30, some of their best friends are people they met in kindergarten. That's the purpose. That's what I think neighborhoods are about. Um, and uh, that's what it's, I, I, in whatever <coughs> neighborhood, uh, whether it's Coolidge Corner or uh, 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 Brookline Village, which always uh, seems to me like an attractive place, reminds me of uh, a West Village in New York, only cleaner. I've <laughs> always liked uh, that, that area. Uh, but uh, essentially the idea is to, the, the stability <coughs> and, uh, and, to, and, to, and to develop and, and improve those, those neighborhoods in a way that's consistent with the, the quality of the daily life that's there now, and so that people can grow up in that kind of environment, I think. I'll add, I grew up in your neighborhood on uh, Asheville Road, and, uh, and a day, day doesn't go by, I don't speak to somebody they went to kindergarten with, yeah. today included, so thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your interest. We will be notifying you in writing about the uh, appointments when they're made. Probably not for another week or so, because we believe we have another one or two candidates coming forward. But as soon as we've interviewed everybody, we do want to try to make the appointments as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your interest. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Stavis Zach. Welcome. Hi. I'm Joyce Davis Sack, and I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 16. <coughs> and I also want to thank you for having me here to interview. And uh, the reason that I'm interested in this is because um, I'm interested in the way things begin, actually. And I'm and I'm very concerned, well, first of all, I suppose, because it's something that's happening. This particular one is happening in my neighborhood. And um, I've been the president of the South Brookline Neighborhood Association for a long time. And I recognize that it's important to start as you mean to go on. So I thought that it, was, it would be something that would be important to be involved with initially to help set up policies and procedures and just um, so that that would be formalized and then this commission could go on um, and deal with all the different, you know, neighborhoods um, in Brookline that, you know, I'm sure that will happen as time goes on. Okay. <clears throat> Questions from members of the board? Yes. Second McGolst. Uh, sure. Uh, and, and thank you for, for uh, volunteering for this combat duty. Um, <laughs> the, um, I wonder if you uh, have any thoughts on the role of a neighborhood conservation district as opposed to the role of zoning or preservation. Where, where, do, you, where do you see the, the role of those three different mechanisms, how they might differ? Well, I have to say that I agree a lot with what Steve said um, <coughs> and that the, um, you know, conservation, this, this um, conservation district commission is sort of getting at the, you know, trying to name, <laughs> create um, the stability of a neighborhood by defining what goes into it, which is a very difficult thing, where zoning is the specifics of that, but doesn't necessarily, something could meet zoning, but not meet the needs of the neighborhood, for example. I think this is a perfect example of that. Thank you. And we, I think, all agree that the um, rules and regulations, policies and procedures 
at this point in time are uh, very important in order for the commission to be able to fulfill its mission effectively. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we would certainly agree with you on that point. Yeah. Any other questions? I, I just wanted nope. to add that through my day job <laughs> as a daycare inspector for the town, I deal with all parts of Brookline and um, am involved with a lot of different you know, neighborhoods and their concerns. And, and also, um, I was on the board of the Brookline Neighborhood Alliance and um, for a long time really tried to work very hard on um, cementing a relationship between North and South Brookline <laughs> <laughs> so that there wasn't this huge division. Yeah, good. So. Okay, thank, you. thank yep. you. I think that yeah. has <coughs> happened uh, now to some extent. The yeah, Brookline really, Neighborhood Alliance has really uh, I think become uh, re-energized uh, or energized and um, I know that there's a, a, a joint uh, EDAB uh, uh, BNA um, process that's going forward now so it is uh, uh, it is an organization that has, has really brought the neighborhoods in town together to some extent. It's been wonderful to see. I you know recall that when I spoke on a panel I don't know, it must have been six, seven years ago. Um, and the, when I described South Brookline, oh, most of the people in the audience were people from North Brookline and just had no clue that there was, you know. What anything out there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Beyond <laughs> Lars Anderson, does anything exist? Right, <laughs> that's it. One, you know, no movie theater, so. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your interest, and as you heard me say, you'll hear from us in writing. All right. Ms. Schneider, interested in the Board of Appeals. Thank you all for the opportunity to come and speak to you here tonight. My name is Johanna Schneider. I've lived in Brookline since 2004. My husband and I are raising our two children here in the town. They're ages two and four. My older son will be starting at the Driscoll School for Kindergarten in the fall. Um, I really love Brookline. I definitely consider it my home. Um, so when I found out that there were vacancies on the zoning board, I thought it would be a great opportunity to contribute to this community that I feel very invested in, um, in particular because I am a land use lawyer by trade. I work at um, the Boston law firm of Rackham and Sawyer and Brewster, um, which is about a 40-person law firm. We specialize in <coughs> real estate law and real estate-related issues. Um, as part of my practice, I routinely appear before zoning boards on behalf of my clients. Usually I'm representing developers who are trying to make a case for a variance or a special permit to, um, to the town board. But I also represent a couple of regional planning authorities as outside litigation counsel, and so I'm familiar with guiding um, a public board in how to interpret and apply their regulations in a way that makes sense and also in a way that keeps them out of trouble and hopefully avoids the possibility of litigation. Um, I understand that you know one of the roles of the board is to is to interpret and fairly apply the bylaws, and I think I have the experience and the expertise to do it, and I would really like to contribute to the town in that way. So I have to ask you, have you looked at our zoning bylaws? I have. <laughs> I have. Oh, good. <laughs> you know what you're getting into. I sure do. Okay. I sure do. All right. Questions from members of the board? Selectman Benka. Yeah, I, um, I actually, when I, when I was practicing, worked with uh, attorneys at Rackham and, um, on projects in Boston. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, I, I don't know whether the firm really practices in Brookline or whether that could be an issue or would be an issue. We occasionally do have some projects in Brookline. I would imagine that if there were ever a conflict, I would recuse myself as, as need be. Right. right. Um, but the bulk of my practice is appearing in Boston. Okay. Any other questions? No questions. Well, <clears throat> we definitely appreciate your interest, and um, we are, I think, at this stage of the game, able to make some appointments fairly soon. I know we have vacancies, so you'll hear from us in writing. Wonderful. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you Thank much. You. Good night. Okay, our next uh, item is a report from the Waldo Street Area Study Committee. Um, and I think we're going to have a little PowerPoint uh, presentation, which sometimes takes a moment to set up. Kara Bruton, our Interim Director of Planning, is in charge here with technical assistance from Ms. Goff.
guess, I guess I will say uh, uh, just uh, sort of a note here. When this committee was formed originally, it had been expected that it would probably make its report at the end of 2012. And it was very clear um, as time passed that it was a larger task than had originally been imagined. And so the committee was, uh, the, the, the work of the committee has been extended. And uh, this is a kind of interim report to update the Board of Selectmen uh, as to the work done by the committee and also probably to give a little indication of where the committee will be going next. Uh, but I believe it's anticipated that there will be a final report this spring. Thank you. Ms. Bruton, you have the floor, the podium uh, and the microphone. Yeah. So for those watching at home, my name is Kara Bruton and I'm the acting director for the planning department. And um, as Betsy said, uh, Betsy and Dick Benka have been co-chairing this committee. It did get started over the summer, but work really kind of ramped up in the fall. Um, and we hope to come back with some recommendations and wrap up our work probably the end of March. Um, the committee, as of today, does not have any recommendations to make at this time. I want to stress that at the beginning so everybody can relax and see where, where the committee is at. Um, you'll see that there's a, a date here on this um, presentation that says December 13th. And that's because this is the exact same presentation that was given December 13th um, to a neighborhood um, outreach group that we had in the same room. Um, so this is the same presentation we did then. We just want to make sure we update the selectmen as well. So it's always good to start by saying, why are we working on this problem? You know, what's the problem we're trying to solve? You may remember some um, <coughs> newspaper um, media note that we got both locally and, and in the Globe. Um, there was, there still are very many retail stores along Pleasant Street um, that are empty. There used to be signs up like this that said retail store for rent, but when you called, nobody answered or nobody showed the property if you tried to. Um, there was significantly more graffiti, which has since been removed. There were trees growing in, in the sidewalk. Um, there was large cracks that went all the way through some of the plate glass on the public sidewalk. And then one of our um, residents who walks past this building um, one day, one of the decorative kind of urn-shaped pieces up at the top literally fell within three inches of her feet as she was walking by. So um, this was Linda Pelkey, who you all know well. So we decided it was time to take some action. And Jean Stringham, um, who you all know as well, a town meeting member in, in the area, um, her quote here was, why is this allowed to look so bad? Why aren't we doing something about this? In the height of these um, enforcement issues were in 2011, there was a large snow pile at the end of Waldo Street, which is a private way. There was reports of um, drug activity, abandoned van, um, an issue with um, rats harboring both in the Durgan garage as well as possibly in some of the vehicles that might have been <coughs> that might have been abandoned. Um, the different departments came together and worked to again clean up. A lot of this is gone. Um, especially some of the trees that were on John Street. It's been, and obviously the snow was removed right away. But we're now at a point where, you know, we've enforced everywhere we can, um, but we still have empty retail um, spaces. And as a side note, we also have not this abandoned van, but we have another van that's out there <laughs> owned by the same party um, that's just being stored there. This is the backside of... Um, what's called the, the Waldo Garage. Um, and this is behind, if you think of CVS on the corner of Harvard and Beacon, there's 1.4 acres of land right behind that CVS on our four corners of downtown that looks like this. A huge empty building. Um, there is some parking um, between the CVS and the, and the Waldo building, and that's very important, something we want to keep for the merchants and also loading and trash being able to take care of back there. Just to orient you, this is Pelham Hall peeking up over the back here. Um, so it's, it's a quite a large piece of land. If you ever walk back there, you'll get a sense of um, how large this property is. This is the study um, charge, the committee's charge that the selectmen gave. And so obviously we wanted to look at current conditions, um, but we also, the scope was quite wide to look at possible 
infrastructure improvements that might help spring something move forward, and then also look at our regulatory toolbox with the main goal of helping this become a vibrant part of Coolidge Corner rather than something that's bringing it down. Um, land use tools included public finance, which may be at the state level as we would do more research, um, and to look at basically the two garages, Waldo Garage and the Darken Garage. So again, to orient you, this is Waldo Street, which is a private um, right-of-way. If you've ever come in to get your, your car fixed at the auto body shop um, right off of Pleasant Street, this is right here, right off the picture, is where you drive in your car. It used to be a Saab auto body, a Saab repair shop in years past. These vents that you see here <coughs> are from the spray booth that takes place in the auto body repair. And often in the summer, on the other side of this building, which is John Street, um, the doors are propped open, windows are open, and we get complaints from um, fumes as people are walking by with their families on John Street. Um, so it may not be the best use for being right next to so many residents and um, other business areas. And then, so that's one building. The other building we have is the Waldo Garage, which is completely empty at this point. You'll see this red X here in the corner. Um, and what that means is that if the building were to um, catch on fire or some big emergency like that, it lets um, safety and fire department know that it's not being occupied and that the value of the building is so low that we're not gonna risk um, safety personnel going into that building to save it. So that's what, just so you know what that X means. So things aren't looking so good. Um, from an aerial perspective, so here's the CVS I was telling you on the corner of, of Harvard and Beacon. The two garages, here's Durgan Garage. So as you come down Pleasant Street, Coolidge Corner Library, of course, is on your right. The Coolidge Corner Library is the busiest branch library in the state. Um, and as you come down Pleasant Street, you'll see there's Right now, there's three out of seven retail shops that are, are full. The other four are empty and have been for several years, which is especially frustrating for everybody that walks by it every single day. But the aerial starts to show you that the bulk of the building, which translates into cash flow of the existing owner, the bulk of the building is the auto body garage. And so there's not as much fin financial incentive to fill up those retail spaces. Um, as it is to keep the auto body garage in place. You'll also see on this aerial um, cars, those are on the roof. This is, we'll get into it later, but the garage is, was built for auto body, um, for parking purposes, and is still um, very hefty, and there's cars up on the roof even today that's used for storage. The other garage that we saw, the Waldo garage, which had the X on it, is back here, kind of buried in the middle of the block. The picture you saw with the brick building was walking back here, um, looking this way at the Waldo Garage. So this Waldo Garage parcel also includes this gravel parking lot back here, which is at the end of Waldo Street. So this is all one parcel that's owned by Chestnut Hill Realty. Chestnut Hill Realty also owns the John Street parking lot, um, which these are not connected right now that there's a fence around. The John Street parking lot is um, rented out to residents in the nearby area. And then the Durgan Garage is owned by a different family, um, Joe Vinograd and his wife. And again, the private right-of-way is, is here. The zoning of this area, most of it is in the um, Coolidge Corner Overlay District, which is general business. But there is you know, a piece of the gravel lot and the John Street lot, which is in multifamily 2.0 zoning. So um, there's multiple properties, multiple owners. Again, the, the Durgan Garage the John Street lot, Waldo Street right-of-way, and the Waldo Garage. So in this summer, the um, committee started by walking the site, and Mel Kleckner joined us as well. We all got to go inside the building, look around. Go, this, the top picture there is actually on the roof. And um, we immediately saw the difference of floor plates, how that might be an issue, the floor-to-floor -floor heights being smaller than what you would want it to be to reuse it for uses other than just storing cars. Um, but we also saw some really great things, especially when you get up on the roof. There's some spectacular views of Coolidge Corner and even going down towards downtown from the roof. And so then we can start imagining um, how this building, if it was used for more public uses or even you know a restaurant, could really take advantage of where the location is. 
the what looks like chicken scratch on the left is 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 pretty hard to read. Um, this was the work from one of our architects, looking early on at kind of all of the haves and and things that we don't have in Coolidge Corner as a whole. So again, looking at this as a piece of Coolidge Corner as as a neighborhood. On the committee, we have um, we do have architects, including. Um, one member who is also a preservation commissioner. We have um, our two co-chairs from the selectmen. We have a um, real estate consultant. We have a real estate attorney. And we have a traffic consultant that works for the state, um, an urban planner. And we also have Adele Fleet Backow who specializes in um, helping communities bring cultural facilities um, into something that's real. So we have a, a really hardworking committee. It's, they're all technical, and most of them live within a walking distance of this building and are very excited to volunteer their time on it. So the committee started coming up with goals of their own, of what, where they see um, their own goals of moving forward. And it all comes back to trying to support, thinking of this site as um, being an anchor, being as a, an engine for Coolidge Corner to help reinforce the uses that are already there that we want to um, support. But we also realize that it has to be something that's economically sustainable. If we were to propose that it's just going to be a park, we would then need to figure out a way to fund to purchase those properties. And these are privately owned. These aren't, you know, nothing's owned by the town. Um, the committee also talked about wanting to provide economic opportunities for, especially for small businesses in Brookline. That was something that's very important. And then to integrate it into the existing pedestrian network, especially with the library and so many people living up Pleasant Street coming down towards Coolidge Corner. So we quickly broke out into three subcommittees, um, regulatory, which deals with kind of zoning, but also um, state rules and policies that might come into play. Um, the architecture subcommittee, which also included an urban designer, and then marketing and feasibility. And um, each of these groups worked on their own um, through networking, got other consultants to do some work for us, um, which volunteer work, which was great. We also, as we were going along, um, did keep in touch with the neighborhood and people like Gene Stringham and Eunice, I think have almost been adopted as um, de facto committee members because they've been participating with us all along. Gene Stringham and Eunice um, White, town meeting members, did designate the Jurgen Garage as one of the state's most endangered um, historic buildings, and that's by Preservation Massachusetts. That was um, that award was given this fall. That doesn't have any regulatory teeth, but it does give um, a lot of publicity towards this building and the fact that it is endangered of coming down. Um, their website, all of our documents and minutes are up there, including lots of photos, um, which is tinyurl.com forward slash Waldo ST. So. Again, we're not going to talk about any specific recommendations tonight, um, but there are kind of five families that the committee is looking at for possible redevelopment scenarios. Um, and some, many of these, even the smaller ones, would likely require zoning changes, which would obviously be difficult in the face of substantial neighborhood opposition for, um, for any of these. So starting with just reusing the garage, could you know could, what could we do if we just reuse the garage as it is? This is a photo from the 1920s, right after um, the garage was built. At the time it was built, it was advertised in the Professional Architectural Journal that it was a new prototype for the time um, that both um, was able to hold garage for cars, for all of these cars that were coming on the roads all of a sudden, but it also had a front area for retail space. and. We've been using, so the retail space is along here on Pleasant Street. This is John Street going back this way. Um, so in some ways, not a lot has changed. We use the floor plans in section even today, and it's as it was built back in 1926. There's um, uh, windows that are divided, we think, by steel. Um, and there's these you know pediments and arches. But it's the, most, um, the front facade really is on. Pleasant Street here. It's the most um, intact of the building. 
So we've talked about the auto body shop um, being in the Durgan garage, and again, that's coming off of Waldo Street. One thing that our traffic, um, our traffic planner on the committee noted early on was Waldo Street itself, which provides access for this building and also provides access for all of these stores along Harvard and Beacon. That road is only 14 feet wide. So just using simple geometry, it would be difficult to use that road as it is now as a main access point for any um, additional use in, that, in the block. And the other big issue is that the distance between Waldo Street and Beacon Street is so short that in order um, to accommodate any significant new traffic, it would be di difficult to do that off of Waldo Street because the stacking length of cars backing up would be so short. So those are two things right off the bat that, um, that we identified. It's likely that anything um, that ha happens here on either parcel or both parcels would probably have its main access off of John Street. <coughs> So these are the plans I was telling you about from the American architect back in 1926. Um, so these are the retail shops along the front, along Pleasant Street. And then the back two thirds of the building, basically on the first floor, but also the upper floors is all for parking garage. Here's the ramp coming in if you get your car serviced. This is the um, little office that's still exactly where it is today. And there's two ramps that go up, one here and one here. Those ramps are about 14 feet wide, and here it is in section. This is actually the basement. So this is the ground level retail, which is really just the first third of the building. And then here's the entrance to the garage, and it ramps up and goes all the way on top of the retail, ramps up again, and then up into the roof. Um, so the floor plates being different make it um, difficult both financially as well as keeping the building intact for historic value and for building code issues the different floor plates are, are a real problem for us. Um, even the first floor in the garage here is off, does not line up with the first floor of the retail along the street. So there's all of these little breaks that would be um, very costly to try to reuse. This is kind of a cutaway that, um, this is all volunteer work. Let me just stop there and say that all of these graphics um, have been donated by time and effort from, um, from our committee members and sometimes their interns. Um, so this is a cutaway of what we just saw. Here it is in 3D, here's the retail shops and you can see the difference in floor plates. One, so one thing we looked at is what's the, what other type of uses could we see in this building that would preserve the building um, but perhaps be something more than something that's dependent on using it for parking or auto body. Um, people in the past have looked at doing, adapting this building for, you know, kind of funky office space. Um, that might be a possibility. We did look at possibly using it as parking today um, and we, did hire a parking consultant that said, um, to our surprise, that the actual garage itself could probably handle to continue being a parking garage, but not surprisingly, it would need to be valet only because we wouldn't want um, individual people trying to negotiate their own cars on these 14-foot wide ramps within this um, tide of a building. So that's a possibility that we're doing more research on the initial Feedback was that financially, um, valet parking would not work here to support the building, even just operations, and that's if the building was up to code. So it's not likely, but we're going to um, go back and double check and see if, for example, <coughs> if we added overnight parking or long-term parking, maybe, maybe that's something that we could um, continue to look at. So that's just reusing the building as it is. Um, slightly more than that, where another scheme is um, this B family, which is adaptive reuse, and that's a broad term. That could mean, you know, keeping most of the building, the front two thirds, and perhaps taking down that back third that was on a different floor plate level. It could mean simply uh, roofing over the the garage that you see on the rooftop, um, and those types of uses. We've again looked at um, office and retail, or 
perhaps a retail anchor. We've heard from um, marketing folks that small, you know, kind of mom and pop retail shops might be okay for some of the storefronts along Pleasant Street, but to imagine that whole building filled up with a, you know, indoor market, tw you know, all year long is probably not feasible. And we also may not want to extend the kind of pedestrian retail away from Harvard and Beacon, um, but it, it would possibly work for an anchor retail, something like a food market or food market and restaurant together, something that draws their own, their own audience. Um, in the C schemes, we start to look at the two parcels together. I should stop and say we did not look at just the Waldo garage by itself, and I'll explain why later when we talk about um, what we can do under existing zoning. But looking at the two parcels together, kind of what could this parcel do to support the Durgan um, parcel, then we start thinking about what kind of uses would work well that basically face a lot of loading and parking and other um, back ends of commercial buildings. So it's not likely to be high-end residential, for example, on these first two floors in the middle of a block, but it could be uses like parking or it could be other uses that don't need that window or that, that streetscape um, visibility along there. Because of the large width of the floor plates, both here and here, um, it's not going to work as well for residential as it would for a commercial use or for a civic use. We have um, talked about in committee meetings civic uses such as early education or even a library use. Um, we have had library trustees come to a couple meetings and the Coolidge Corner <coughs> library is interested eventually in doing a significant renovation and so they you know by no means are looking to put all their eggs in one basket with this project but if there was a way that a library use could be combined with other uses on this site um, that also <coughs> resulted in a um, cheaper renovation cost for the library it's something they would be interested in looking at so here we um, start looking at more intense uses the narrower floor plate that you see off um, here, whoop, here is right on John Street. And it was, uh, this is one possible scenario, but the width of this floor, these floor plates up here are, would work really well for residential uses or assisted living, as well as hotel. Um, so those are all uses that we think might work well both for um, being cited in a way that the shadow impacts would be on a parking lot rather than residents back here in the Coolidge Green and um, John Street condos, but that might financially support uses that we want to see in the ground floor like smaller retail shops or possibly civic uses. Um, one thing that we've been very cognizant of, especially with two selectmen at all the meetings, is what any <laughs> residential use um, would do to our already burdened school system. And so to return back where, where we kind of started, um, this scenario would clearly re require a zoning change, which would be difficult unless the, um, the neighborhood was really behind it. The other thing we need to do is look at possibilities um, in comparison to what could be done under our zoning already, under our existing zoning. So. This, the following, the E family is, you know, us thinking about what could be done under the existing zoning. This is the Durgan garage by itself, basically nothing. If the Durgan garage was um, looked at by itself, it would likely stay the way it is or a building very similar to what you see today um, because the zoning, the building has more square footage than what's allowed by zoning. One thing that you could see here, uh, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is the um, building, although it's very historic, built in the 20s and well-loved and beautiful facade, um, has limited protection as far as historic um, regulations are concerned. It is not in a local historic district. It is National Register eligible, which means that we may be able to utilize some state or federal tax credits, but other than issuing an 18-month delay, for demolition, we don't have any regulatory teeth in preserving the building as it is. So one thing we might see here, if it was Durgan Garage by itself, is a very simple residential. This is with our existing zoning using parking requirements that we currently have. 
um, because it's in the Coolidge Corner Overlay District, you would see not all residential on the first floor, so you might see some small shops still remaining on Pleasant Street. Um, this is a simple in and out um, system that's above ground parking. So this is basically a building on stilts. It looks like a two-story building. And these are 10 units on top of parking. I'm not saying that's what the committee wants to see here. We're just trying to get an understanding of what could be done with existing zoning. This is... Um, how, how many units was that? 10. I mean, it's not a lot. This is um, looking at what could be done with just the Waldo um, parcel by itself. This drawing was done, I think, about 10 years ago now and went fairly long along the way in permitting. Um, but frankly, it's a little ridiculous. <laughs> There's townhomes here that are proposed where their front lawns are looking out onto the back of the commercial buildings. We don't think this is a viable thing that's going to happen. This scheme has all of the access coming off of Waldo Street. Um, it is true that because of the way that ownership goes, they could have access off Waldo and John Streets and make that open up a little bit more. Um, but we've played around with different scenarios, and we simply don't think that um, there any use would make sense other than just a parking garage would make sense on Waldo Street by itself. So. This is looking at both parcels together, if they were developed together, under existing zoning. Um, so this is about 90 units is what we could put here. And again, it's using our existing parking requirements um, that's already in zoning. The floor plate here works well for a double loaded corridor. So there's four stories of residential on top of basically two stories of parking um, with perhaps some adjacent retail space along again, along Pleasant Street. This, just, just a comment, this would not be as of right. Um, yeah. this, this would require special <coughs> permits, it would require bonuses and so forth, so it's... Uh, yes, thank you, no, that's an important point. Nothing is as of right, basically, in <laughs> Brookline, um, especially if it's more than five units, then special permits are triggered. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, a development scheme that could potentially happen with special permits being granted. So that's where the committee's at so far. We've, you know, um, we're trying to challenge a little bit about whether or not we might be able to preserve the Durgan Garage, even though our preservation commissioner is saying it can't be done. We are hiring a um, <coughs> preservation architect to, you know, go through the building code item by item and give us a a bulk estimate of what it would cost um, to preserve the garage, either in part or in whole. Um, we know that access is an issue, as we talked about earlier. Um, we may need to think about infrastructure changes that can happen to allow this site to be redeveloped. Um, as far as uses are concerned, residential uses are obviously very financially feasible right now, and also the location of the site is um, one that lends itself well to residential uses. Um, we do hear from hotel consultants that another hotel in Brookline um, is possible and could possibly work on this site, especially if it goes up and over the surrounding buildings. Um, office uses would be very challenging here, um, especially because they would want real visibility from the streets on, you know, for the whole building, and this just isn't the right site. In addition, office uses are higher impacts <coughs> with regards to parking and traffic, and because this is right in the middle of Coolidge Corner, we don't think that's probably not a good use. Um, again, destination food use is a possibility, and there is still some interest in exploring some of that use for civic uses, whether it's a library or early education or something like that. Um, we are talking a lot to the um, Green Street condos, which is, you know, it's their backyard, which is where this empty site is sitting. It's their backyard where these rats are coming into this building um, and where taxis are hanging out in the gravel parking lot. So um, our conversation so far, they're very much interested in seeing something happening here because nothing has happened for so long. But we also need to... Um, obviously keep in mind that this is their backyard. We need to protect it for shadow, you know, who's looking into their, their back windows. And then on the other side, the commercial buildings with the loading and trash needs to be protected in order to keep um, Coolidge Corner going. Um, 
and then shadow impacts we think can be minimized because of the orientation of the whole site. We could do it in such a way that the bulk of the shadow impacts are, again, on a parking lot rather than on residential homes. So how can the town gain control here? We've um, so There's three main ways that the town can have a, a real seat at the table. One is if there is part of the building that's used as a municipal use. Another way is working with state agencies, both financially and through um, policy or permitting. We have had an initial meeting with um, DHCD. And they were very excited about this site, um, especially after seeing photographs of its condition as it is. And then the third is the carrot, and that's the rezoning opportunities, finding a scheme that might work well both for a potential buyer as well as for the town and the neighborhood. So our short term, this is my last slide, our short term next steps, um, we're aiming for a final report in the end of March. We continue to get feedback from residents. We're also meeting individually with property owners, um, <coughs> both the property owners, obviously, obviously the owners of the property, but also the adjacent property owners. Um, and our next meeting is January 18th at 8.15 in the first floor. And the, the, on the agenda is to um, look at a scope to hire two consultants, one for preservation and one for um, looking at this financially, of which scenarios might work financially and be feasible. Any questions? <laughs> well. <laughs> it's a lot. Yes. Selectman Goldstein. Oh, Thanks. sorry. Selectman Rommel, are you raising yeah, your hand? I am. Oh, no, go ahead. Please. No, no. Go first. I didn't realize that. We, I, no. Go ahead. Um, Kara, I know when that... First of all, thank you. This is food for a lot of thought. Um, sorry? You always thank people. <laughs> you know, it's the right thing to do. Uh, if I could, I would send her a handwritten thank you note. But, you know. Um, I know when that flurry of media activity happened that was in your first few slides that you had heard from some developers who were interested in doing walkthroughs and taking a look and you know had expressed some initial interest in making something happen on the site. I'm wondering if they've been engaged in the, that process at all, if there's been feedback from you know not just theoretical people who could envision what could happen here, but actual people who had expressed interest in the site, and if any of that is reflected in the various scenarios we've just seen. Yeah, they have. I can um, tell you what we've already been discussing at public meetings. We have seen interest over this is over the last you know two years now. We have seen interest at one time or another from um, a small grocery store, from a hotel user, um, and mostly from people that want to build residential units. We have um, we had the pleasure of having one of those people that um, well, and then also um, a group that was looking at doing the adaptive reuse for office and retail, for just the Durgan building only. Um, all of those people obviously did not move forward with the building. Um, everybody that looked at the building quickly came to the realization that the Durgan doesn't work well at the price they're asking for, unless it's with Waldo. And Waldo doesn't work without Durgan. And so you really need to have both of those properties together in order to do something significant here that, um, that would probably move forward. Um, we also, though, had one of those developers come in and talk to us at a public meeting, which was great. And <coughs> he said, here's what I looked at. In order to meet the market price, I would need to build a residential building. And you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was for this for the Durgan garage only. Um, need to basically take it all down and do a, a building that was 12 or 15 stories tall. Mm. Because of our parking requirements and because it's just the Durgan building on its own, by the time you build up, and he was talking about all above ground parking, um, it just keeps going up. And he realized, of course, he's actually also a Brooklyn resident, realized there's no way that's going to fly, and so moved on. So but really, helpful, the, really helpful. It was. It was feedback. Yep, it was good to hear exactly what people are thinking, what the market is saying, um, and the you know these theoretical people are um, in retail, also hotel, um, are also people that are giving these recommendations to people looking in the market. So um, that's been very helpful. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. I actually, <laughs> Selectman Marmel uh, anticipated my question, but uh, in the Great context of right. answering it. Uh, I, I, Two more occurred to me. So, um, the first is um, 
how cooperative are the current property owners uh, in, in this process? What, what have you heard from them directly? Uh, you said that there was a purchase price for, for um, Durgan Street, but um, are, are they actively being marketed? And uh, Yeah, so um, the retail spaces along Pleasant Street um, have been empty for way too long. Um, in the last two years, 18 months or so, we have had the pleasure of working with Al Kramer, who's a retired judge, um, I think a, a known person in this area. And he's also a, um, goes back with a family that owns the Durgan Garage for decades. Um, he is an attorney and he is our, our key point person right now as we go through. He's on our email list for all of the committee updates and we do trade phone calls and emails um, every other week of keeping each other updated. Right now, his main goal, of course, for his client is to um, find a potential buyer, and that may be in the short term or in the long term buyer. It may be someone who rents, you know, leases <coughs> the whole space and then buys at the end of 10 years. Um, someone that can do the structure of financing that works well for the family. Um, so his focus is on speak, continuing conversation with what he calls a short list, but basically three potential buyers, and one of them has been very public and kind of obvious, and that's Chestnut Hill Realty. Um, since they own the Waldo Garage, this site is probably the most valuable to them than it would be to other um, people looking at the site. We have also spoken with people that have been interested in the site, including Chestnut Hill Realty, both as a potential buyer and as an owner of part of the study area. And they've all been very interested in what the committee's doing but not engaged, you know, they feel like it's too early, they need to figure out what the site's worth um, as it is, and they would expect that for anything to happen, it would probably take two to three years of, first of all, understanding the building, the structural integrity of the concrete. You know, nobody has done the studies for environmental cleanup. All of that would need to be done uh, before even thinking about buying it. I should use this opportunity to say that there has been, there was some, Vicious rumors um, running around, especially with the holiday parties, that Chestnut Hill Realty had already purchased the Durgan garage. That is not true. Um, however, Al Kramer, the attorney for the Durgan garage, has <coughs> confirmed that they are in serious negotiations. And I think that what that means is penciling you know, a possible purchase and sale agreement. So things are moving forward. Um, and they're certainly keeping you know, one eye on, on the committee as we move forward with them. Um, all of the committee members have continually expressed the desire to get the potential buyers into a committee meeting um, and try to think of things that everybody is interested, uses that everybody wants to do. Uh, just a, an aside, uh, you mentioned um, that one of the prohibiting factors on uh, <coughs> residential development there, which uh, the schools are obviously a huge issue there too, but you mentioned parking. And uh, I serve on the the, the moderators uh, parking committee, and uh, this kind of coincides well with something that that was has been discussed in that committee, which is the idea that that uh, the residential development that's close to transit, the way this is, uh, may be appropriate to reduce our, our, our fairly uh, onerous parking requirements, which are basically two spaces per unit. Uh, so I'm interested to, yeah. to hear that that was a specific uh, <coughs> reaction that you heard. Yeah. Although I'm not saying that residential use here is appropriate for other reasons. Too. Right, right. And w um, that was one reason why we wanted to look at the existing zoning, um, because even with the parking requirements the way they are, you know, 2.3 spaces if you have a three-bedroom unit, you can still do it when you have combined parcels, especially when the Waldo parcel is so buried anyways it would just be above ground parking. And so looking at the corner of John and Pleasant Street, do we really want to see a lot of above ground parking? Maybe not. Maybe we would rather see a use like retail or a civic use that's on the, on the sidewalk. We, we did, however, also, just to add, um, <clears throat> have some conversations about senior housing. And um, Coolidge Corner is a very attractive place. We have now become an age-friendly community. Um, it's very walkable. Uh, our senior center is located within easy walking distance. So it's actually possible to think about some residential uses that might have less 
um, parking need. In other words, senior housing um, may be re it may be reasonable for there to be a reduced parking requirement, um, and that certainly alleviates some of the concerns about adding children to the schools. But all of those are just ideas that are out there. There's no uh, concrete proposal of any sort. We just tried to think of uses that seem both <coughs> compatible with the site, with the site constraints, and also uh, with the Coolidge Corner area. Thanks to the committee. Good work, everybody. Very informative. And there's more to come. Sackman Benka, you have any yeah, thoughts I, you want I just to want add? to say thank you to Kara, Ms. <laughs> Bruton. It's uh, a lot easier sitting here and watching than it is delivering it. So, uh, so right. I should say that we did this exact same presentation, but before Dick and Betsy helped me by, we each did a third. So um, ah, I think that we, worked out We better. knew you could do it yeah. all by yourself. I was, a lot. I was just looking for the popcorn <laughs> as I was sitting up here. <laughs> Couldn't find right. it. Well, thank you very much, and thanks to the committee. I will absolutely second the comment that this has been an incredibly diligent, hardworking, talented group of people who have not only worked on their own, but brought in their associates who have professional credentials. Um, it's, it's really been an extraordinary experience, and we've learned a lot. Um, some of it probably adds complication, but at least we really understand the site now, and, and both its potential and its limitations. And the next meeting is January 18th, so come. January 18th, right, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, no action required here. Let's move on. We do have, finally, our um, Committee on Planning for Enrollment Growth in the Public Schools, and I do see Mr. Morse, the chair of the school committee, sitting out there in case anybody has a question. Um, the, there, there are two pages, and the final version is what was distributed uh, tonight. So find the one that's big, that's got large type as opposed to the, the tiny type. <coughs> um, the first page is uh, a proposed vote, and then the second page is a charge to the committee but also it has been edited from the version that we last voted, so it's not identical language, and I think it's important for everybody to know that. And if you want to know where the changes are, they're on the copy that came to you um, separately that has color um, edits, so you can see what the difference is. Um, and I should also say that um, <clears throat> uh, the chair of the school committee has read these uh, revised versions and, as I understand, uh, has agreed that they are uh, appropriate and would be prepared to submit this to his school committee who voted a different version. So we're still sort of in the iteration stage, but anyway. Questions, comments from members of the board? Just that I'm, I'm sorry that I will not be able to participate yes, in this. Yes, this is planned. another case of abandonment. I know. I'm sorry. And it's me you've abandoned. <laughs> I just have to say that out loud. Okay. All right. But I did recruit Catherine Craven. You did. You did. And and for that, I thank you enormously. And therefore, I would forgive you for abandoning <laughs> me. And Alan. Um, okay. So, uh, and also for the record, um, there is a list of the members, folks who've been recruited. We're going to vote the um, membership. I, note, I think sure. Catherine's first name is not spelled that way. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Well, then we'll fix that. I, I think I inherited that from somebody. I wouldn't have known how to spell it. But we'll correct that. But what I want to draw your attention to is that we have both the town administrator and the superintendent as members but ex officio non-voting members. So they'll serve on the committee, they'll be very supportive, but they're not going to be voting members. And um, there will be um, forthcoming, I don't think we have it right now, but there will be forthcoming um, information about each one of them. Um, there's a, a sort of a, a slightly annotated list here. Um, 
but I, I will say, I'm, I apologize to Ms. Craven for getting her name wrong, uh, spelled incorrectly, um, <clears throat> but it's appropriate to acknowledge that she uh, also is a former director of the um, state's school building authority and therefore brings great knowledge to the committee. And she's a Brookline parent at Baker. So, any questions? No questions. All right, hearing none, I propose, I move, that we take the vote, <clears throat> which I guess I will read out loud, uh, and then vote the members of the committee. The, f the first item <clears throat> is to, I move that we appoint a committee on space planning for enrollment growth in the public schools of Brookline, or the Case for Space Committee, consisting of 13 members, including two parents of public school students, two other members of the community, two members of the advisory committee, two selectmen, and two members of the school committee, the superintendent of schools, the town administrator, and a member of the building commission, with such committee to have the charge attached hereto, and with selectmen DeWitt and Goldstein to be the selectmen's appointees to such committee. Further, it is recognized that additional capital or operating expenditures or additional revenues, including a potential override or debt exclusion, may be required to address the currently expected space needs of the public schools of Brookline. The Board of Selectmen understands and expects that it will be necessary to evaluate the impact of existing policies and whether savings, revenues, or more efficient service delivery could be realized while maintaining or improving the present system standards through adjustments in policies or practices, including without limitation, those related to personnel, non-mandatory programs, non-mandatory student enrollments, class size, student and student assignments, and facility utilization. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Mermel. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Chair votes aye. And then I'm going to ask, I'm going to move that we um, approve and accept the charge. I do not think I need to read it out loud. Um, and at the same time, um, we would be making the appointments, and I will read the names of the appointees. Um, as parents, Catherine Craven and Philip Kramer. As community members, Fred Wang and Linda Crossley. From the advisory committee members, Neil Wyshynski and Mike Sandman. Uh, from the selectman's office, Betsy DeWitt and Ken Goldstein with the town administrator, Mel Kleckner. From the school committee, Chair Alan Morse and Rebecca Stone and Superintendent Bill Lupini and from the Building Commission, George Cole. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Mermel. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Chair votes aye. And that concludes the business for the Board of Selectmen. And um, we, we will f continue to watch with interest and with great appreciation the career of our former about-to-be Selectman Mermel. Till Monday. This is true. We, we know you're still here, but we're not going to see you no. again. So uh, we wish you the best of luck and success in your new uh, position, and you must take very good care of the marathon dog. I absolutely will. You can come visit it when you come for Brookline oh. Selectman Visit the Legislators Day. We will absolutely do that. Yeah. Okay, thank you all, and good night.